Emerald City was built a great many years ago, for I was a young man when the balloon brought me here, and I am a very old man now. But my people have worn green glasses on their eyes so long that most of them think it really is an Emerald City. And it certainly is a beautiful place, abounding in jewels and precious metals and every good thing that is needed to make one happy. I have been good to the people and they like me. But ever since this palace was built, I have shut myself up and would not see any of them. One of my greatest fears was the witches. For while I had no magical powers at all, I soon found out that the witches were really able to do wonderful things. There were four of them in this country, and they ruled the people who live in the north and south and east and west. Fortunately, the witches of the north and south were good, and I knew they would do me no harm. But the witches of the east and west were terribly wicked. And had they not thought I was more powerful than they themselves, they would surely have destroyed me. As it was, I lived in deadly fear of them for many years. So you can imagine how pleased I was when I heard your house had fallen on the wicked witch of the east. When you came to me, I was willing to promise anything if you would only do away with the other witch. But now that you have melted her, I am ashamed to say that I cannot keep my promises. I think you are a very bad man. Oh, no, my dear. I'm really a very good man. But I'm a very bad wizard, I must admit. Can't you give me brains? You don't need them. You are learning something every day. A baby has brains, but it doesn't know much. Experience is the only thing that brings knowledge, and the longer you are on Earth, the more experience you are sure to get. That may all be true, but I shall be very unhappy unless you give me brains. The false wizard looked at him carefully. He said with a sigh, well, I'm not much of a magician, as I said, but if you will come to me tomorrow morning, I will stuff your head with brains. I cannot tell you how to use them, however. You must find that out for yourself. Oh, thank you! Thank you! I'll find a way to use them, never fear! But how about my courage? You have plenty of courage, I am sure. All you need is confidence in yourself. There is no living thing that is not afraid when it faces danger. True courage is in facing danger when you are afraid. And that kind of courage you have in plenty. Perhaps I have, but I'm scared just the same. I shall really be very unhappy unless you give me the sort of courage that makes one forget he is afraid. Very well, I will give you that sort of courage tomorrow. How about my heart? Why, as for that, I think you are wrong to want a heart. It makes most people unhappy. If you only knew it, you are in luck not to have a heart. That must be a matter of opinion. For my part, I will bear all the unhappiness without a murmur, if you will give me the heart. Very well. Come to me tomorrow and you shall have a heart. I have played wizard for so many years that I may as well continue the part a little longer. And now... How am I to get back to Kansas? We shall have to think about that. Give me two or three days to consider the matter, and I'll try to find a way to carry you over the desert. In the meantime, you shall all be treated as my guests, and while you live in the palace, my people will wait upon you and obey your slightest wish. There is only one thing I ask in return for my help, such as it is. You must keep my secret and tell no one I am a humbug. They agreed to say nothing of what they had learned and went back to their rooms in high spirits. Even Dorothy had hoped that the great and terrible humbug, as she called him, would find a way to send her back to Kansas. And if he did, she was willing to forgive him everything. Chapter 16, The Magic Art of the Great Humbug. Next morning, the scarecrow said to his friends, Congratulate me. I am going to Oz to get my brains at last. When I return, I shall be as other men are. I have always liked you as you were. It is kind of you to like a scarecrow, but surely you will think more of me when you hear the splendid thoughts my new brain is going to turn out. Then he said goodbye to them all in a cheerful voice and went to the throne room, where he rapped upon the door. Come in. The Scarecrow went in and found the little man sitting down by the window engaged in deep thought. The Scarecrow remarked a little uneasily, I have come for my brains. Oh, yes. Sit down in that chair, please. 
You must excuse me for taking your head off, but I shall have to do it in order to put your brains in their proper place. That's all right. You are quite welcome to take my head off as long as it will be a better one when you put it on again. So the wizard unfastened his head and emptied out the straw. Then he entered the back room and took up a measure of bran, which he mixed with a great many pins and needles. Having shaken them together thoroughly, he filled the top of the scarecrow's head with the mixture and stuffed the rest of the space with straw to hold it in place. When he had fastened the scarecrow's head on his body again, he said to him, Hereafter you will be a great man, for I have given you a lot of brand new brains. The Scarecrow was both pleased and proud at the fulfillment of his greatest wish. And having thanked Oz warmly, he went back to his friends. Dorothy looked at him curiously. His head was quite bulged out at the top with brains. How do you feel? I feel wise indeed. When I get used to my brains, I shall know everything. Why are those needles and pins sticking out of your head? That is proof that he is sharp. Well, I must go to Oz and get my heart. The woodman walked to the throne room and knocked at the door. Come in. The woodman entered and said, I have come for my heart. Very well. But I shall have to cut a hole in your breast so I can put your heart in the right place. I hope it won't hurt you. Oh, no. I shall not feel it at all. So Oz brought a pair of tinner shears and cut a small square hole in the left side of the tin woodman's breast. Then going to a chest of drawers, he took out a pretty heart made entirely of silk and stuffed with sawdust. Isn't it a beauty? It is, indeed. The woodman was greatly pleased. But is it a kind heart? Oh, very. He put the heart in the woodman's breast and then replaced the square of tin, soldering it neatly together where it had been cut. There. Now you have a heart that any man might be proud of. I'm sorry I had to put a patch on your breast, but it really couldn't be helped. Never mind the patch. I am very grateful to you and shall never forget your kindness. Don't speak of it. Then the tin woodman went back to his friends, who wished him every joy on account of his good fortune. The lion now walked to the throne room and knocked at the door. Come in. The lion announced, entering the room. I have come for my courage. Very well, I will get it for you. He went to a cupboard and reaching up to a high shelf took down a square green bottle, the contents of which he poured into a green gold dish beautifully carved. Placing this before the cowardly lion who sniffed at it as if he did not like it, the wizard said, Drink. What is it? Well, if it were inside of you, it would be courage. You know, of course, that courage is always inside one, so that this really cannot be called courage until you have swallowed it. Therefore, I advise you to drink it as soon as possible. The lion hesitated no longer, but drank till the dish was empty. How do you feel now? Full of courage! And the lion went joyfully back to his friends to tell them of his good fortune. Oz left to himself smile to think of his success in giving the scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion exactly what they thought they wanted. How can I help being a humbug when all these people make me do things that everybody knows can't be done? It was easy to make the scarecrow and the lion and the woodman happy because they imagined I could do anything. But it will take more imagination to carry Dorothy back to Kansas and I'm sure I don't know how it can be done. Chapter 17, How the Balloon Was Launched For three days, Dorothy heard nothing from Oz. These were sad days for the little girl, although her friends were all quite happy and contented. The Scarecrow told them there were wonderful thoughts in his head, but he would not say what they were because he knew no one could understand them but himself. When the Tin Woodman walked about, he felt his heart rattling around in his breast, and he told Dorothy he had discovered it to be a kinder and more tender heart than the one he had owned when he was made of flesh. The lion declared he was afraid of nothing on earth and would gladly face an army of men or a dozen of the fierce Kaleidas. Thus, each of the little party was satisfied except Dorothy, who longed more than ever to get back to Kansas. On the fourth day, to her great joy, Oz sent for her, and when she entered the throne room, he said pleasantly, 
Sit down, my dear. I think I have found the way to get you out of this country. And back to Kansas? Well, I'm not sure about Kansas, for I haven't the faintest notion which way it lies. But the first thing to do is to cross the desert, and then it should be easy to find your way home. How can I cross the desert? Well, I'll tell you what I think. You see, when I came to this country, it was in a balloon. You also came through the air, being carried by a cyclone. So I believe the best way to get across the desert will be through the air. Now, it is quite beyond my powers to make a cyclone. But I've been thinking the matter over, and I believe I can make a balloon. How? A balloon is made of silk, which is coated with glue to keep the gas in it. I have plenty of silk in the palace, so it will be no trouble to make the balloon. But in all this country, there is no gas to fill the balloon with to make it float. If it won't float, it will be of no use to us. True. But there is another way to make it float, which is to fill it with hot air. Hot air isn't as good as gas, for if the air should get cold, the balloon would come down in the desert and we should be lost. We? Are you going with me? Yes, of course. I am tired of being such a humbug. If I should go out of this palace, my people would soon discover I am not a wizard, and then they would be vexed with me for having deceived them. So I have to stay shut up in these rooms all day, and it gets tiresome. I'd much rather go back to Kansas with you and be in a circus again. I shall be glad to have your company. Thank you. Now, if you will help me sew the silk together, we will begin to work on our balloon. So Dorothy took a needle and thread, and as fast as Oz cut the strips of silk into proper shape, the girl sewed them neatly together. First there was a strip of light green silk, then a strip of dark green silk, and then a strip of emerald green. For Oz had a fancy to make the balloon in different shades of the color about them. It took three days to sew all the strips together, but when it was finished, they had a big bag of green silk more than 20 feet long. Then Oz painted it on the inside with a coat of thin glue to make it airtight after which he announced that the balloon was ready. But we must have a basket to ride in. So he sent the soldier with the green whiskers for a big clothes basket, which he fastened with many ropes to the bottom of the balloon. When it was all ready, Oz sent word to his people that he was going to make a visit to a great brother wizard who lived in the clouds. The news spread rapidly throughout the city, and everyone came to see the wonderful sight. Oz ordered the balloon carried out in front of the palace, and the people gazed upon it with much curiosity. The tin woodman had chopped a big pile of wood, and now he made a fire of it. And Oz held the bottom of the balloon over the fire so that the hot air that arose from it would be caught in the silken bag. Gradually, the balloon swelled out and rose into the air until finally the basket just touched the ground. Then Oz got into the basket and said to all the people in a loud voice, I am now going away to make a visit. While I am gone, the Scarecrow will rule over you. I command you to obey him as you would me. The balloon was by this time tugging hard at the rope that held it to the ground, for the air within it was hot, and this made it so much lighter in weight than the air without that it pulled hard to rise into the sky. Come, Dorothy, hurry up, or the balloon will fly away. I can't find Toto anywhere. Dorothy did not wish to leave her little dog behind. Toto had run into the crowd to bark at a kitten, and Dorothy at last found him. She picked him up and ran toward the balloon. She was within a few steps of it, and Oz was holding out his hands to help her into the basket when crack went the ropes and the balloon rose into the air without her. Come back. I want to go, too. Oz called from the basket. I can't come back, my dear. Goodbye! Everyone shouted, Goodbye! And all eyes were turned upward to where the wizard was riding in the basket, rising every moment farther and farther into the sky. And that was the last any of them ever saw of Oz, the wonderful wizard. Though he may have reached Omaha safely and be there now for all we know. But the people remembered him lovingly and said to one another, Oz was always our friend. When he was here, he built for us this beautiful emerald city. And now he is gone. He has left the wise scarecrow to rule over us. Still, for many days, they grieved over the loss of the wonderful wizard and would not be comforted. Chapter 18, Away to the South. Dorothy wept bitterly at the passing of her hope to get home to Kansas again. 
But when she thought it all over, she was glad she had not gone up in a balloon. And she also felt sorry at losing Oz, and so did her companions. The tin woodman came to her and said, Truly, I should be ungrateful if I failed to mourn for the man who gave me my lovely heart. I should like to cry a little because Oz is gone. If you will kindly wipe away my tears so that I shall not rust. With pleasure. She brought a towel at once. Then the tin woodman wept for several minutes, and she watched the tears carefully and wiped them away with the towel. When he had finished, he thanked her kindly and oiled himself thoroughly with his jeweled oil can to guard against mishap. The scarecrow was now the ruler of the Emerald City, and although he was not a wizard, the people were proud of him. They said, There is not another city in all the world that is ruled by a stuffed man. And so far as they knew, they were quite right. The morning after the balloon had gone up with Oz, the four travelers met in the throne room and talked matters over. The scarecrow sat in the big throne and the others stood respectfully before him. Said the new ruler, We are not so unlucky, for this palace and the Emerald City belong to us, and we can do just as we please. When I remember that a short time ago I was up on a pole in a farmer's cornfield and that now I am the ruler of this beautiful city, I am quite satisfied with my lot. I also am well pleased with my new heart. And really, that was the only thing I wished in all the world. For my part, I am content in knowing I am as brave as any beast that ever lived, if not braver. If Dorothy would only be contented to live in the Emerald City, we might all be happy together. But I don't want to live here. I want to go to Kansas and live with Aunt Em and Uncle Henry. Well then, what can be done? The Scarecrow decided to think, and he thought so hard that the pins and needles began to stick out of his brains. Finally, he said, Why not call the winged monkeys and ask them to carry you over the desert? I never thought of that. It's just the thing. I'll go at once for the golden cap. When she brought it into the throne room, she spoke the magic words, and soon the band of winged monkeys flew in through the open window and stood beside her. Bowing before the little girl, the monkey king said, This is the second time you have called us. What do you wish? I want you to fly with me to Kansas. But the monkey king shook his head. That cannot be done. We belong to this country alone and cannot leave it. There has never been a winged monkey in Kansas yet, and I suppose there never will be, for they don't belong there. We shall be glad to serve you in any way in our power, but we cannot cross the desert. Goodbye. And with another bow, the monkey king spread his wings and flew away through the window, followed by all his band. Dorothy was almost ready to cry with disappointment. I have wasted the charm of the golden cap to no purpose, for the winged monkeys cannot help me. The tender-hearted woodman said, It is certainly too bad. The scarecrow was thinking again, and his head bulged out so horribly that Dorothy feared it would burst. Let us call in the soldier with the green whiskers and ask his advice. So the soldier was summoned and entered the throne room timidly, for while Oz was alive, he never was allowed to come farther than the door. The scarecrow said to the soldier, This little girl wishes to cross the desert. How can she do so? I cannot tell, for nobody has ever crossed the desert unless it is Oz himself. Is there no one who can help me? Glenda might. Who is Glenda? The Witch of the South. She is the most powerful of all the witches and rules over the quadlings. Besides, her castle stands on the edge of the desert, so she may know a way to cross it. Glinda is a good witch. Isn't she? The quadlings think she is good and she's kind to everyone. I have heard that Glinda is a beautiful woman who knows how to keep young in spite of the many years she has lived. How can I get to her castle? The road is straight to the south, but it is said to be full of dangers to travelers. There are wild beasts in the woods and a race of queer men who do not like strangers to cross their country. For this reason, none of the quadlings ever come to the Emerald City. The soldier then left them, and the scarecrow said, it seems, in spite of dangers, that the best thing Dorothy can do is to travel to the land of the South and ask Glinda to help her. For, of course, if Dorothy stays here, she will never get back to Kansas. You must have been thinking again. I have. I shall go with Dorothy, for I am tired of your city and long for the woods and the country again. 
I am really a wild beast, you know. Besides, Dorothy will need someone to protect her. That is true. My axe may be of service to her, so I also will go with her to the land of the south. The scarecrow asked, When shall we start? They asked in surprise, Are, Are you, you going? going? Certainly. If it wasn't for Dorothy, I should never have had brains. She lifted me from the pole in the cornfield and brought me to the Emerald City. So my good luck is all due to her. And I shall never leave her until she starts back to Kansas for good and all. Thank you. You're all very kind to me. But I should like to start as soon as possible. We shall go tomorrow morning. So now let us all get ready, for it will be a long journey. Chapter 19, Attack by the Fighting Trees. The next morning, Dorothy kissed the pretty green girl goodbye, and they all shook hands with the soldier with the green whiskers who had walked with them as far as the gate. When the guardian of the gate saw them again, he wondered greatly that they could leave the beautiful city to get into new trouble. But he at once unlocked their spectacles, which he put back into the green box, and gave them many good wishes to carry with them. He said to the scarecrow, You are now our ruler, so you must come back to us as soon as possible. I certainly shall if I am able, but I must help Dorothy to get home first. As Dorothy bade the good-natured guardian a last farewell, she said, I have been very kindly treated in your lovely city, and everyone has been good to me. I cannot tell you how grateful I am. Don't try, my dear. We should like to keep you with us. But if it is your wish to return to Kansas, I hope you will find a way. He then opened the gate of the outer wall, and they walked forth and started upon their journey. The sun shone brightly as our friends turned their faces toward the land of the south. They were all in the best of spirits and laughed and chatted together. Dorothy was once more filled with the hope of getting home, and the scarecrow and the tin woodman were glad to be of use to her. As for the lion, he sniffed the fresh air with delight and whisked his tail from side to side in pure joy at being in the country again, while Toto ran around them and chased the moths and butterflies, barking merrily all the time. As they walked along at a brisk pace, the lion remarked, City life does not agree with me at all. I have lost much flesh since I lived there, and now I am anxious for a chance to show the other beasts how courageous I have grown. They now turned and took a last look at the Emerald City. All they could see was a mass of towers and steeples behind the green walls, and high up above everything, the spires and dome of the Palace of Oz. As he felt his heart rattling around in his breast, the tin woodman said, Oz was not such a bad wizard after all. He knew how to give me brains, and very good brains, too. If Oz had taken a dose of the same courage he gave me, he would have been a brave man. Dorothy said nothing. Oz had not kept the promise he made her, but he had done his best, so she forgave him. As he said, he was a good man, even if he was a bad wizard. The first day's journey was through the green fields and bright flowers that stretched about the Emerald City on every side. They slept that night on the grass with nothing but the stars over them, and they rested very well indeed. In the morning, they traveled on until they came to a thick wood. There was no way of going around it, for it seemed to extend to the right and left as far as they could see. And besides, they did not dare change the direction of their journey for fear of getting lost. So they looked for the place where it would be easiest to get into the forest. The scarecrow, who was in the lead, finally discovered a big tree with such wide-spreading branches that there was room for the party to pass underneath. So he walked forward to the tree. But just as he came under the first branches, they bent down and twined around him. And the next minute he was raised from the ground and flung headlong among his fellow travelers. This did not hurt the scarecrow, but it surprised him and he looked rather dizzy when Dorothy picked him up. The lion called... Here is another space between the trees. Let me try it first, for it doesn't hurt me to get thrown about. He walked up to another tree as he spoke, but its branches immediately seized him and tossed him back again. This is strange. What shall we do? The trees seem to have made up their minds to fight us and stop our journey. I believe I will try it myself. The woodman shouldered his axe and marched up to the first tree that had handled the scarecrow so roughly. 
When a big branch bent down to seize him, the woodman chopped at it so fiercely that he cut it in two. At once the tree began shaking all its branches as if in pain, and the tin woodman passed safely under it. He shouted to the others, Come on, be quick. They all ran forward and passed under the tree without injury, except Toto, who was caught by a small branch and shaken until he howled. But the woodman promptly chopped off the branch and set the little dog free. The other trees of the forest did nothing to keep them back, so they made up their minds that only the first row of trees could bend down their branches, and that probably these were the policemen of the forest, and given this wonderful power in order to keep strangers out of it. The four travelers walked with ease through the trees until they came to the farther edge of the wood. Then, to their surprise, they found before them a high wall which seemed to be made of white china. It was smooth like the surface of a dish and higher than their heads. What shall we do now? said the tin woodman. I will make a ladder, for we certainly must climb over the wall. Chapter 20, The Dainty China Country. While the woodman was making a ladder from wood which he found in the forest, Dorothy lay down and slept, for she was tired by the long walk. The lion also curled himself up to sleep, and Toto lay beside him. The scarecrow watched the woodman while he worked and said to him, I cannot think why this wall is here, nor what it is made of. Rest your brains and do not worry about the wall. When we have climbed over it, we shall know what is on the other side. After a time, the ladder was finished. It looked clumsy, but the tin woodman was sure it was strong and would answer their purpose. The scarecrow waked Dorothy and the lion and Toto and told them that the ladder was ready. The scarecrow climbed up the ladder first, but he was so awkward that Dorothy had to follow close behind and keep him from falling off. When he got his head over the top of the wall, the scarecrow said, Oh, my! Go on! So the scarecrow climbed farther up and sat down on the top of the wall and Dorothy put her head over. And just as the scarecrow had done, she cried, Oh, my! Then Toto came up and immediately began to bark, but Dorothy made him be still. The lion climbed the ladder next, and the tin woodman came last. But as soon as they looked over the wall, both of them cried, Oh, my! Oh, my! When they were all sitting in a row on the top of the wall, they looked down and saw a strange sight. Before them was a great stretch of country having a floor as smooth and shining and white as the bottom of a big platter. Scattered around were many houses made entirely of china and painted in the brightest colors. These houses were quite small, the biggest of them reaching only as high as Dorothy's waist. There were also pretty little barns with china fences around them and many cows and sheep and horses and pigs and chickens all made of china were standing about in groups. But the strangest of all were the people who lived in this queer country. There were milkmaids and shepherdesses with bright colored bodices and golden spots all over their gowns, and princesses with most gorgeous frocks of silver and gold and purple, and shepherds dressed in knee breeches with pink and yellow and blue stripes down them and golden buckles on their shoes, and princes with jeweled crowns upon their heads wearing ermine robes and satin doublets and funny clowns in ruffled gowns with round red spots upon their cheeks and tall pointed caps. And strangest of all, these people were all made of china, even to their clothes, and were so small that the tallest of them was no higher than Dorothy's knee. No one did so much as look at the travelers at first, except one little purple china dog with an extra large head, which came to the wall and barked at them in a tiny voice, afterward running away again. How shall we get down? They found the ladder so heavy they could not pull it up, so the scarecrow fell off the wall and the others jumped down upon him so that the hard floor would not hurt their feet. Of course, they took pains not to light on his head and get the pins in their feet. When all were safely down, they picked up the scarecrow, whose body was quite flattened out, and padded his straw into shape again. 
We must cross this strange place in order to get to the other side, for it would be unwise for us to go any other way except due south. They began walking through the country of the China people, and the first thing they came to was a China milkmaid milking a China cow. As they drew near, the cow suddenly gave a kick and kicked over the stool, the pail, and even the milkmaid herself, all falling on the china ground with a great clatter. Dorothy was shocked to see that the cow had broken her leg short off and that the pail was lying in several small pieces, while the poor milkmaid had a nick in her left elbow. The milkmaid cried angrily, There, see what you have done. My cow has broken her leg, and I must take her to the mender's shop and have it glued on again. What do you mean by coming here and frightening my cow? I'm very sorry. Please forgive us. But the pretty milkmaid was much too vexed to make any answer. She picked up the leg sulkily and led her cow away, the poor animal limping on three legs. As she left them, the milkmaid cast many reproachful glances over her shoulder at the clumsy strangers, holding her nicked elbow close to her side. Dorothy was quite grieved at this mishap. The kind-hearted woodman said, we must be very careful here, or we may hurt these pretty little people so they will never get over it. A little farther on, Dorothy met a most beautifully dressed young princess who stopped short as she saw the strangers and started to run away. Dorothy wanted to see more of the princess, so she ran after her. But the China girl cried out, Don't chase me! Don't chase me! She had such a frightened little voice that Dorothy stopped and said, Why not? The princess, also stopping a safe distance away, answered, because if I run, I may fall down and break myself. But could you not be mended? Oh, yes, but one is never so pretty after being mended, you know. I suppose not. The china lady continued. Now, there is Mr. Joker, one of our clowns, who is always trying to stand upon his head. He has broken himself so often that he is mended in a hundred places and doesn't look at all pretty. Here he comes now so you can see for yourself. Indeed, a jolly little clown came walking toward them, and Dorothy could see that in spite of his pretty clothes of red and yellow and green, he was completely covered with cracks running every which way and showing plainly that he had been mended in many places. The clown put his hands in his pockets, and after puffing out his cheeks and nodding his head at them saucily, he said, My lady fair, why do you stare at poor old Mr. Joker? You're quite as stiff and prim as if you'd eaten up a poker, said the princess. Be quiet, sir. Can't you see these are strangers and should be treated with respect? Well, that's respect, I expect. And the clown immediately stood upon his head. The princess said to Dorothy, Don't mind Mr. Joker. He is considerably cracked in his head, and that makes him foolish. Oh, I don't mind him a bit. But you are so beautiful that I am sure I could love you dearly. Won't you let me carry you back to Kansas and stand you on Aunt Em's mantel shelf? I could carry you in my basket. That would make me very unhappy. You see, here in our country, we live contentedly and can talk and move around as we please. But whenever any of us are taken away, our joints at once stiffen and we can only stand straight and look pretty. Of course, that is all that is expected of us when we are on mantel shelves and cabinets and drawing room tables. But our lives are much pleasanter here in our own country. I would not make you unhappy for all the world. So I'll just say goodbye. Goodbye. They walked carefully through the China country. The little animals and all the people scampered out of their way, fearing the strangers would break them. And after an hour or so, the travelers reached the other side of the country and came to another China wall. It was not so high as the first, however, and by standing upon the lion's back, they all managed to scramble to the top. Then the lion gathered his legs under him and jumped on the wall. But just as he jumped, he upset a china church with his tail and smashed it all to pieces. That was too bad. But really, I think we were lucky in not doing these little people more harm than breaking a cow's leg in a church. They are all so brittle. They are indeed. And I am thankful I am made of straw and cannot be easily damaged. There are worse things in the world than being a scarecrow. Chapter 21, The Lion Becomes the King of Beasts. 
After climbing down from the China Wall, the travelers found themselves in a disagreeable country, full of bogs and marshes and covered with tall, rank grass. It was difficult to walk without falling into muddy holes, for the grass was so thick that it hid them from sight. However, by carefully picking their way, they got safely along until they reached solid ground. But here, the country seemed wilder than ever. And after a long and tiresome walk through the underbrush, they entered another forest where the trees were bigger and older than any they had ever seen. The lion declared, looking around him with joy, This forest is perfectly delightful. Never have I seen a more beautiful place. It seems gloomy. Not a bit of it. I should like to live here all my life. See how soft the dried leaves are under your feet and how rich and green the moss is that clings to these old trees. Surely no wild beast could wish a pleasanter home. Perhaps there are wild beasts in the forest now. I suppose there are, but I do not see any of them about. They walked through the forest until it became too dark to go any farther. Dorothy and Toto and the lion lay down to sleep while the woodman and the scarecrow kept watch over them as usual. When morning came, they started again. Before they had gone far, they heard a low rumble as of the growling of many wild animals. Toto whimpered a little, but none of the others was frightened, and they kept along the well-trodden path until they came to an opening in the wood in which were gathered hundreds of beasts of every variety. There were tigers and elephants and bears and wolves and foxes and all the others in the natural history. And for a moment, Dorothy was afraid. But the lion explained that the animals were holding a meeting, and he judged by their snarling and growling that they were in great trouble. As he spoke, several of the beasts caught sight of him, and at once the great assemblage hushed as if by magic. The biggest of the tigers came up to the lion and bowed, saying, Welcome, O king of beasts! You have come in good time to fight our enemy and bring peace to all the animals of the forest once more. What is your trouble? We are all threatened by a fierce enemy which has lately come into this forest. It is a most tremendous monster like a great spider with a body as big as an elephant and legs as long as a tree trunk. It has eight of these long legs and as the monster crawls through the forest, he seizes an animal with his leg and drags it to his mouth where he eats it as a spider does a fly. Not one of us is safe while this fierce creature is alive. And we had called a meeting to decide how to take care of ourselves when you came among us. The lion thought for a moment. Are there any other lions in this forest? No, there were some, but the monster has eaten them all. And besides, they were none of them nearly so large and brave as you. If I put an end to your enemy, will you bow down to me and obey me as king of the forest? Returned the tiger. We will do that gladly. And all the other beasts roared with a mighty roar. We will! Where is this great spider of yours now? Yonder among the oak trees. The tiger pointed with his forefoot. Take good care of these friends of mine, and I will go at once to fight the monster. He bade his comrades goodbye and marched proudly away to do battle with the enemy. The great spider was lying asleep when the lion found him, and it looked so ugly that its foe turned up his nose in disgust. Its legs were quite as long as the tiger had said, and its body covered with coarse black hair. It had a great mouth with a row of sharp teeth a foot long, but its head was joined to the pudgy body by a neck as slender as a wasp's waist. This gave the lion a hint of the best way to attack the creature. And as he knew it was easier to fight it asleep than awake, he gave a great spring and landed directly upon the monster's back. Then with one blow of his heavy paw, all armed with sharp claws, he knocked the spider's head from its body. Jumping down, he watched it until the long legs stopped wiggling when he knew it was quite dead. The lion went back to the opening where the beasts of the forest were waiting for him and said proudly, You need fear your enemy no longer. Then the beasts bowed down to the lion as their king, and he promised to come back and rule over them as soon as Dorothy was safely on her way to Kansas. Chapter 22, The Country of the Quadlings. 
The four travelers passed through the rest of the forest in safety, and when they came out from its gloom, saw before them a steep hill covered from top to bottom with great pieces of rock. Said the scarecrow, That will be a hard climb, but we must get over the hill nevertheless. So he led the way, and the others followed. They had nearly reached the first rock when they heard a rough voice cry out, Keep back. Who are you? Then a head showed itself over the rock, and the same voice said, This hill belongs to us, and we don't allow anyone to cross it. But we must cross it. We're going to the country of the Quadlings. But you shall not. And there stepped from behind the rock the strangest man the travelers had ever seen. He was quite short and stout and had a big head, which was flat at the top and supported by a thick neck full of wrinkles. But he had no arms at all. And seeing this, the scarecrow did not fear that so helpless a creature could prevent them from climbing the hill. So he said, I'm sorry not to do as you wish, but we must pass over your hill, whether you like it or not. And he walked boldly forward. As quick as lightning, the man's head shot forward, and his neck stretched out until the top of the head, where it was flat, <laughs> struck the scarecrow in the middle and sent him tumbling over and over down the hill. Almost as quickly as it came, the head went back to the body, and the man laughed harshly as he said, It isn't as easy as you think. A chorus of boisterous laughter came from the other rocks, and Dorothy saw hundreds of the armless hammerheads upon the hillside, one behind every rock. The lion became quite angry at the laughter caused by the scarecrow's mishap, and giving a loud roar that echoed like thunder, he dashed up the hill. Again, a head shot swiftly out, and the great lion went rolling down the hill as if he had been struck by a cannonball. Dorothy ran down and helped the scarecrow to his feet, and the lion came up to her feeling rather bruised and sore and said, It is useless to fight people with shooting heads. No one can withstand them. What can we do then? Call the winged monkeys. You still have the right to command them once more. Very well. And putting on the golden cap, she uttered the magic words. The monkeys were as prompt as ever. And in a few moments, the entire band stood before her. Bowing low, the king of the monkeys inquired, What are your commands? Carry us over the hill to the country of the Quadlings. It shall be done. At once, the winged monkeys caught the four travelers and Toto up in their arms and flew away with them. As they passed over the hill, the hammerheads yelled with vexation and shot their heads high in the air. But they could not reach the winged monkeys, which carried Dorothy and her comrades safely over the hill and set them down in the beautiful country of the Quadlings. The leader said to Dorothy, This is the last time you can summon us. So goodbye and good luck to you. Goodbye and thank you very much. And the monkeys rose into the air and were out of sight in a twinkling. The country of the quadlings seemed rich and happy. There was field upon field of ripening grain with well-paved roads running between and pretty rippling brooks with strong bridges across them. The fences and houses and bridges were all painted bright red, just as they had been painted yellow in the country of the Winkies and blue in the country of the Munchkins. The quadlings themselves, who were short and fat and looked chubby and good-natured, were dressed all in red, which showed bright against the green grass and the yellowing grain. The monkeys had set them down near a farmhouse, and the four travelers walked up to it and knocked at the door. It was opened by the farmer's wife, and when Dorothy asked for something to eat, the woman gave them all a good dinner, with three kinds of cake and four kinds of cookies, and a bowl of milk for Toto. The child asked, How far is it to the castle of Glinda? The farmer's wife answered, It is not a great way. Take the road to the south, and you will soon reach it. Thanking the good woman, they started afresh and walked by the fields and across the pretty bridges until they saw before them a very beautiful castle. Before the gates were three young girls dressed in handsome red uniforms trimmed with gold braid. And as Dorothy approached, one of them said to her, uh, Why have you come to the South Country? To see the good witch who rules here. Will you take me to her? Let me have your name, and I will ask Glinda if she will receive you. They told who they were, and the girl soldier went into the castle. After a few moments, she came back to say that Dorothy and the others were to be admitted at once. Chapter 23, Glinda Grants Dorothy's Wish. 
Before they went to see Glinda, however, they were taken to a room of the castle where Dorothy washed her face and combed her hair, and the lion shook the dust out of his mane, and the scarecrow patted himself into his best shape, and the woodman polished his tin and oiled his joints. When they were all quite presentable, they followed the soldier girl into a big room where the witch Glinda sat upon a throne of rubies. She was both beautiful and young to their eyes. Her hair was a rich red in color and fell in flowing ringlets over her shoulders. Her dress was pure white, but her eyes were blue, and they looked kindly upon the little girl. She asked, What can I do for you, my child? Dorothy told the witch all her story how the cyclone had brought her to the land of Oz, how she had found her companions, and of the wonderful adventures they had met with. She added, My greatest wish now is to get back to Kansas, for Aunt Em will surely think something dreadful has happened to me, and that will make her put on mourning. And unless the crops are better this year than they were last, I am sure Uncle Henry cannot afford it. Glinda leaned forward and kissed the sweet, upturned face of the loving little girl. Bless your dear heart. I am sure I can tell you of a way to get back to Kansas. But if I do, you must give me the golden cap. Willingly. Indeed, it is of no use to me now. And when you have it, you can command the winged monkeys three times. And I think I shall need their service just those three times. Dorothy then gave her the golden cap, and the witch said to the scarecrow, What will you do when Dorothy has left us? I will return to the Emerald City, for Oz has made me its ruler and the people like me. The only thing that worries me is how to cross the hill of the Hammerheads. By means of the golden cap, I shall command the winged monkeys to carry you to the gates of the Emerald City. For it would be a shame to deprive the people of so wonderful a ruler. Am I really wonderful? You are unusual. Turning to the Tin Woodman, Glinda asked, What will become of you when Dorothy leaves this country? He leaned on his axe and thought a moment. Then he said, the Winkies were very kind to me and wanted me to rule over them after the Wicked Witch died. I am fond of the Winkies, and if I could get back again to the country of the West, I should like nothing better than to rule over them forever. My second command to the Winged Monkeys will be that they carry you safely to the land of the Winkies. Your brain may not be so large to look at as those of the Scarecrow, but you are really brighter than he is when you are well polished, and I am sure you will rule the Winkies wisely and well. Then the witch looked at the big shaggy lion and asked, When Dorothy has returned to her own home, what will become of you? Over the hill of the Hammerheads lies a grand old forest, and all the beasts that live there have made me their king. If I could only get back to this forest, I would pass my life very happily there. My third command to the winged monkeys shall be to carry you to your forest. Then... Having used up the powers of the golden cap, I shall give it to the king of the monkeys that he and his band may thereafter be free forevermore. The scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion now thank the good witch earnestly for her kindness. And Dorothy exclaimed, You are certainly as good as you are beautiful, but you have not yet told me how to get back to Kansas. Your silver shoes will carry you over the desert. If you had known their power, you could have gone back to your Aunt Em the very first day you came to this country. But then I should not have had my wonderful brains. I might have passed my whole life in the farmer's cornfield. And I should not have had my lovely heart. I might have stood and rusted in the forest till the end of the world. And I should have lived a coward forever. And no beast in all the forest would have had a good word to say to me. This is all true, and I'm glad I was of use to these good friends. But now that each of them has had what he most desired, and each is happy in having a kingdom to rule beside, I think I should like to go back to Kansas. The silver shoes have wonderful powers, and one of the most curious things about them is that they can carry you to any place in the world in three steps, and each step will be made in the wink of an eye. All you have to do is to knock the heels together three times and command the shoes to carry you wherever you wish to go. If that is so, I will ask them to carry me back to Kansas at once. She threw her arms around the lion's neck and kissed him, patting his big head tenderly. Then she kissed the tin woodman, who was weeping in a way most dangerous to his joints. But she hugged the soft, stuffed body of the scarecrow in her arms instead of kissing his painted face and found she was crying herself at this sorrowful parting 
from her loving comrades. Glinda the Good stepped down from her ruby throne to give the little girl a goodbye kiss, and Dorothy thanked her for all the kindness she had shown to her friends and herself. Dorothy now took Toto up solemnly in her arms, and having said one last goodbye, she clapped the heels of her shoes together three times, saying, Take me home to Aunt Em. Instantly, she was whirling through the air, so swiftly that all she could see or feel was the wind whistling past her ears. The silver shoes took but three steps, and then she stopped so suddenly that she rolled over upon the grass several times before she knew where she was. At length, however, she sat up and looked about her. Good gracious! For she was sitting on the broad Kansas prairie, and just before her was the new farmhouse Uncle Henry built after the cyclone had carried away the old one. Uncle Henry was milking the cows in the barnyard, and Toto had jumped out of her arms and was running toward the barn, barking joyously. Dorothy stood up and found she was in her stocking feet, for the silver shoes had fallen off in her flight through the air and were lost forever in the desert. Chapter 24, Home Again. Aunt Em had just come out of the house to water the cabbages. When she looked up and saw Dorothy running toward her, she cried, My darling child! And she folded the little girl in her arms and covered her face with kisses. Where in the world did you come from? Said Dorothy gravely. From the land of Oz. And here is Toto, too. And, oh, Aunt Em, I'm so glad to be at home again. <laughs> 